This is Duke University. Kathy Davidson um, is the Ruth DeVarney Professor of English and the John Hope Franklin um, um, Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies here at the uh, Franklin Humanities Institute and in the English Department. Um, we know her many, many books, Revolution and the Word, um, the um, 36 Views of Mount Fuji, um, the edition of uh, Zitka Lhasa, and also I think something that might be quite um, appropriate for us to think about here today, closing the life and death of an American factory in terms of what's uh, happening um, as we speak. So um, I think I will just pass it on to Kathy because we're um, looking forward very much to the discussion. And um, so please, please welcome Kathy. Interestingly, I've given a lot of talks at Duke about Haystack. Uh, there's little flyers on your chairs about the competition that Haystack is co-running with the MacArthur Foundation, Digital Media and Learning. That's informational, but if you know anyone who might be interested in applying, there's still 15 days left before the deadline. Um, my two um, esteemed colleagues in Haystack are here, and I'm not sure if I, everyone knows them. Mandy Daly, who runs the Digital Media and Learning competition, and Jonathan Tarr, who is Haystack Program Coordinator, National Program Coordinator. What occurred to me, though, is I had never actually given an intellectual paper on digitality before. I'm finishing a book on cognition and digitality. Um, this actually is not really part, part of that book, but it is a, a real live scholarly red paper with footnotes and references. And I've never done that at Duke, which is kind of funny since I do it every place else. So um, I thought today I would give a real paper. Um, it's a real paper with a mystery because I have no idea if these slides are going to correspond to what I'm saying, but you know, we, can, we can wing it. So um, the paper is, it's got five parts and uh, I think it has 18 slides and it's 23 and a half minutes long, just so you can plan your, your time. So um, part one is defining and dematerializing technology. The brilliant polymath and information age sage, Alan Kay, likes to say that technology is anything invented after you were born. His witty definition reminds us that although technology seems like a noun, it operates as a verb, an active verb that incites generational anxiety, paranoia, confusion, and fear. There may now be one billion registered users on the internet and 3.3 billion users of mobile phones worldwide. But those enormous numbers incite less anxiety than the image of a teenage girl secretly texting no one knows who, or an adolescent boy using his cell phone to play a first-person shooter game. The enthusiastic use of mobile technologies by youth as their own networked social space, what has been called a third space that is both private and public, is the source of much current cultural anxiety. Of course, when tragedy strikes, as it did this summer, with the horrific story of Tomohiro Kato's mass murder in Akihabara, Japan, technology is often blamed. But interestingly, it's only some technologies that are blamed. Quote, a penchant for anime and computer games, the pundit said, warning about Kato. Kato had blogged from his mobile phone uh, before running his truck into a crowd in um, Akihabara and killing several people. What was less mentioned in the media accounts was the fact that he was a part-time and way underpaid factory worker. His occupation was rarely noticed in the media. Yet if this tragedy had occurred in 1930 or even 1960, surely the deadening and dehumanizing nature of factory work would have been analyzed as the cause. Factory work, however, does not fit into our contemporary narrative of the stressed out post-industrial, so-called post-industrial, age of information. Similarly, whenever there is a terrible incident of school violence in the US, games seem likely to be labeled as the culprit. 
The FBI itself recently, recently made the linkage explicit, noting that school shooters were almost always game players. Maybe. But the problem with that logic was revealed just last week when the first national survey of games and kids, on, kids playing games online was released by the Pew Internet and American Life Project. It turns out that among American teens aged 12 through 17, and this was a cross-gender, cross-race, cross-economic study, a full 97% play games. That's 97%. It's no wonder that among such a number, there are occasionally extremely, extremely disturbed young people who do terrible things. But with a number like 97%, we can no longer think of video games as a problem. What we have, rather, is a changed environment. Whether we are talking about terrible events in Akihabara or the various events that link school, the, uh, in the lineage of school violence that goes back to Columbine, the events are tragitory, tragic, but the explanatory technophobic narrative superimposed on those events is overdetermined. One point of my talk today is to defamiliarize that narrative, or rather to theorize its unarticulated op operations and objectives. My implicit assumption is that technology is not just a tool, but a techne, a complex of uneven and shifting cultural, social, familial, institutional, political, economic, ideological and industrial processes and practices, as well as a locus of anxieties for those processes. A construct such as new technology or new media becomes the test site for fears about the future and about generational continuity. A new technology are we right now? is particularly difficult to define since it moves so rapidly from being the object of cultural obsession to invisibility often with very few intermediate stages in the history of technology. Thus, we find pundits often concerned to ask questions about the impact of mobile technologies on youth. By contrast, we would not inquire about the impact of electricity or automobiles on youth today, although we certainly could, probably should. Indeed, we, given global warming and all the rest, um, indeed, we probably would not even pay much attention in 2008 to digital photography as a major area of our concern about subjectivity and sociality. Yet only a decade ago, pundits were warning that digital cameras would forever compromise such timeless human values as truth, authenticity, evidence, and even reality. How quickly we forget. Perhaps we might even say that a technology no longer fat falls into the category of, a, of new when we stop worrying about how it will change us we cannot see that it already has. One of our functions as, as ethnographers, designers, theorists, and historians of technology is to discover the submerged or embedded operations of cultural change. Another function is to expose anomalies, those factors that command our society's attention when seemingly similar factors are, are ignored. So it is intriguing to think not only about what counts as new technology, but what does not count as new technology copy machines, videotapes, CDs, MP3s, fax machines, even email. If my Google search is in any way illustrative, there's been relatively little moral commentary on humankind going to the dogs because of these technologies when they were new. They were not particularly clumped and marked and categorized even under the phrase new technologies. By contrast, the two poles of techno-determinism, utopian and apocalyptic, permeate the recent reception history of such disparate communication technologies as mass printing, daguerreotype, which was the first form of photography, telephony, movies, radio, TV, the internet, and now the mobile phone. The last is particularly interesting. Since my vote, Motorola Vice President Martin Cooper invented the cell phone in 1973, that's it in the upper, right, upper left-hand corner, <laughs> admittedly it wasn't very mobile. It weighed over two pounds, but even in the incarnations throughout the 1980s and 1990s, it wasn't called new technology or new media and wasn't the subject of moral approbation. It was simply a device. It didn't become a marked and kind of hysterical new technology with all the attendant weight of that category for a few decades. Its widespread adoption by youth as a social networking site with its own private language and cultural forms 
games and cell phone novels is what started to cause the moral panic of the mid-90s to the present. One distinguishing feature of the category of new technology is its agentive power, as if technology itself were the active agent, not its users. I'm interested in what the displacement of agency is about. I would follow anthropologist Robert Foster here in suggesting that in addressing new technologies, we need to disentangle the constituent parts. He advocates sorting out the, quote, shifting networks or assemblages of people and things, humans and non-human actors, whose, quote, agency is distributed within such networks. Along with Foster, I am suggesting that we need to dematerialize technology and deconstruct terms such as mobile technology or digital use. I'm also concerned not to create digital use as the other. Othering denies agency and specificity to those who populate the category. Are the 76% of high school age kids who drop out of Detroit public schools this year the same digital youth as the 84% who graduate from affluent suburban schools in Bloomfield Hills, nine miles away? I am arguing that in addition to thinking about the changing role of traditional institutions, we need to think about the way the falterings and flaws of traditional, so-called traditional institutions cast digital youths as scapegoats and put new technologies in the role of causing or symbolizing the failures that might more appropriately be a charge to those traditional national and global financial, corporate, and government institutions themselves. To that end, in thinking about digital youth and mobile technologies, I want to ask who is doing the mobilizing? Who is being mobilized? and in what role, with what function, and to what purpose. Uh, the next section is called An Historical Analogy. Before returning to contemporary digital youth, I would like to make a detour back to an even historical instance of new media. As a reception theorist and historian of the book, I'm convinced we can learn a lot about anxieties about mobile technologies in the present era of global neoliberalism by looking way back to the inventions of mass printing and cheap paper during the great original age of liberalism, the world of the, of the 18th century and Adam Smith. The cultural form most popular in the first age of mass printing was the popular novel. It was printed in small duodecimo editions that could be transported in the secret pockets that were hastily added to the skirts of women's dresses and to men's pantaloons precisely for the purpose of carrying and concealing this controversial new written, fo written form written in large parts for youth, about youth, and sometimes by youth. With a shout out to Ann Allison's magisterial work on Japanese toys, I would suggest that the cheap duodecimo was the prosthetic pocket monster the Pokemon, that's what po Pokemon means, of the late 18th century. As I've noted a long time ago in Revolution in the Word, the rise of the novel in America, it was not just historical accident that the American Revolution occurred the same year as the publication of Adam Smith's An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. The founding fathers in the US were steeped in Scottish liberalism, which formed the basis of much of the post-revolutionary thinking, including the US Constitution, with its overt exclusions based on race, gender, and property, and its near profound hysteria over mobocracy. By the way, if you want to talk about the John Adams bio, whatever it is, don't ask me. I, haven't, I, I boycotted it. I haven't seen it. I read the book. That was enough. Um, it's such a, anyway. That's another subject. <laughs> Ask about the Alien and Sedition Acts and I can take up an afternoon. Um, it is now customary to rhapsodize, that was deleted by the way from the series. It is now customized, customary to rhapsodize over the vision of the public sphere among the fa founding fathers. But this is jingoistic nostalgia, diverse from the actual brass knuckle politics of the US post-revolutionary period. The public ideology of republicanism used to motivate a populace to fight the Revolutionary War masked a more privately expressed elitist, aristocratic, and anti-democratic anglophilia. Interestingly, what many of the founding fathers most feared about the mob was its new media, its fascination with an uncontrolled, unruly, illiterate new form, the popular novel. Mass printing, the production of cheap paper and ink, and the mechanizing of book binding, along with the creation of circulating libraries for cheap distribution, made novels available as never before. As with video games, texting, and other popular forms of mobile digital culture today, in the late 18th century, the relationship of technology and its popular cultural products worked the other way too. 
because of the insatiable appetite of a new demography of readers, the undereducated and the young of all classes, the enormous popularity of the novel also fueled technological innovation. It created a market, a need, and a consumer public that made innovation more profitable and thus possible. What worried the elite was that non-privileged readers, exactly those excluded from full citizenship by the US Constitution, were devouring cheap novels written with a relatively simple vocabulary and a plain style, and that featured uneducated, resourceful beggar girls, runaway slaves, serving maids, and factory boys. These books were wild, episodic, and romantic tales like Sex and the City of Adventure and Seduction, <laughs> full of sex, cities, scandal, corruption, piracy, cross-dressing, and swashbuckling of various sorts. The main characters were typically bold and yet economically humble young heroes and heroines who were often in peril because of villainous aristocrats who were often both slaveholders and libertines. Many social arbiters blame the new medium of the novel for contributing to anarchy, social unrest, the erosion of traditional social institutions, including the family, school, and work. Uh, we'll see. Novels, it was said, led the young astray, made them both promiscuous and vulnerable to sexual predation by adults, caused dissatisfaction with authority figures, disrespect for parents, and led to an addiction to solitary pleasures that unsuited them for productive, productive employment or social life. Novels instigated youth to violence against others and themselves. Lots of novel suicides in novels. Um, novels made young people stupid distracted them, and spoiled them for responsible adulthood. Sound familiar? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> the cell phones are revolting. <laughs> the use of an analogy. This is part three. The brief summary of points of similarity between the Jeremiah against the early American novel and the great era of liberalism and the contemporary screeds about our mobile com computational technologies in our ne ne neoliberal era helps to focus the question of why this technology and not others. It also illuminates the related question of what is new about this so-called new technology. One of the key similarities is in the issue of agency. Whether early American novel or video game, an agentive power is attributed to the cultural form and its enabling technology. We see this in the titles of two books that have just appeared in 2008. Maggie Jackson's book is called Distracted, The Erosion of Attention and the Coming Dark Age. Ooh. <laughs> and Mark Bar Bauerlein's book is even better. It's called The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future parentheses, or don't trust anyone under 30. That's, that's the whole, that's really the title. Really? This apocalyptic adult hysteria reminds me of Jeremiah's Against the Novels, which came with titles such as Novel Reading, A Cause of Female Depravity. <laughs> the current adult hyperbole conveys the sense that a mesmerizing cultural form has reduced human actors to the status of passive victims, but victims who nonetheless have the potential to tumble all of us into the dark ages. The rhetorical formulation, the evacuation of agency, most clearly resembles, here we come, <laughs> discussions of inductees in a cult and its mesmerizing leader. Historians of film and television will recognize these tropes. The digital game has all but displaced television as the preternatural power beyond human ag agency that can be blamed for the mantras act of youth violence wherever it, it erupts. The adjectival digital in the construct digital youth becomes the agentive explanation overriding any other factors including economic future, current job possibilities, mental state, uh, bankrupt school system, breakdown of familial re relations, and so forth. Next part is called digital agency. Do it yourself, which is DIY culture, or do it for them. As co-founder of Haystack, and as a member of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation's initiative on digital media and learning, I have for several years had a large professional stake in thinking about digitality and learning. What is new about new media, I keep asking myself and others. 
The more I think about it, the more I think about what m is most striking about this era's particular form of new era, new media, and about digital youth more generally, is participation, a term I'm using to imply both agency and interaction. I would love to discuss this further, but I think it's time to reconsider the bowling alone paradigm put forth by Robert Putnam in, the ter in terms of virtual networks and virtual communities. The Pew study, for example, reveals that this is the most civically engaged generation since the 1960s. They did, this is a very, very long study that just came out, I think September 16th or something, which um, uh, has some very interesting findings. That is significant in view of the fact that several other recent studies in both England and the US suggest that, the, that kids are finding their lives and their privacy more policed than ever before. Something, one might add, that thanks to the Patriot Act is certainly true of adults as well. I'm going to suggest that perhaps digitality offers a way around contemporary surveillance and policing, even though, of course, it is also surveilled and policed. Digitality may offer youth the rare place beyond the obvious control of parents, teachers, and other authority figures for some, some form of independence and self-expression, not to mention, as in the Obama campaign, pain, remarkable abilities to organize themselves for a political cause. Participation returns us to the notion of agency. The complicated, variable, and paradoxical nature of digital active participation, agency, strikes me as more pronounced than what we have seen before in other communication technologies. In fact, the do-it-yourself or DIY ideology of digital youth is in stark contrast with, even in friction with, the cult or mind control version of digital media that one finds in the punditry. That is so much the case that one has to wonder if one is inversely related to the other. What if, instead of youth being passive victims of technology, they had actually found a way in which they could use digital norms for creative labor? This is DIY creativity, often collaborative and dis indistinguishable from social interaction and social networking, but that exists in a public domain under new unregulated open source rules, um, open source rules for appropriation, customizing, and remixing, expressed in act activist terms by what Christopher Kelty calls the cultural significance of free software. The result is ex expressivity for users from professional hackers to five-year-olds customizing their Pokemon games. But here's a caution, too. Digital creati creativity is also a lucrative source of free labor for corporations investing in mobile technologies. Do-it-yourself becomes do-it-for-them. Whoop, that was supposed to be before. OK. So this is do-it-yourself, and I'll get to do-it-for-them. Data mining. Whose data? Who is doing the mining? The ideology of user-generated content, or USG, is that it is free, a new socialist system of social exchange among users, seemingly beyond capitalist production. However, to be a user is not free. Phones, software, telecommunication services all cost money. One pays, one contributes, one often is not paid for one's contribution. Facebook, for example, which charges nothing, that's in quotes, for entry, is valued at $15 billion. Its value comes from mining all the, quote unquote, free demographic and marketing data it collects from those of us who are selecting our interests, telling about our affinities, choosing our consumer and political groups, or even choosing our Facebook friends. All data. And sometimes the data is far more tang tangible, even if virtual. In Second Life, for example, 90% of the objects in the virtual world are actually created by residents in Second Life without those residents, in most cases, being remunerated. This is exciting for users, but Second Life, in the end, is a for-profit corporation. This new relationship between creati creativity, agency, capital, presumption, consumption, and exploitation is so complex that it seems like every day there's a new scholarly coinage to describe these relationships. Quite a while ago, Alvin, Alvin Toffler used a pre-digital term which has been taken up again, prosumption a term that originally was used to de delineate the complicated relationships of production and consumption. Axel Bruns has recently coined the rather grotesque producage to suggest even further that the issue is that the producer of content is also a user. Consumption doesn't really even fit within this new paradigm. 
And Tom Bolerstoff has recently begun to talk in terms of, quote, creationist capitalism, with the religious overtones completely intended. And he, by that, he means to designate a new form of labor where creativity itself is the labor. Yet what all of these terms obscure is the gigantic global profit being made from so-called free user-generated content. Do it yourself is also do it for Rupert Mur Murdoch. What is also missed in the US is that the neoliberalist betrayal of the promise of visionaries such as Tim Berners-Lee and God bless him, Al Gore, of a publicly funded information superhighway. Of course, this has come up again in the Obama campaign, but for the last eight years, it's completely been abandoned. We are now far closer to a global digital tollway. New communications technology give generational anxieties a locus. It is far easier to blame technology than to adapt to it. It is also far easier to blame youthful enthusiasm for new technologies than to take responsibility for economic, political, or social fa failures that result in a diminished futurity for the next generation. The market collapse and chaos of this week certainly underscores the generational culpability here. Neoliberalism's fa failures are our failures that youth inherit from us as our legacy, whatever our means. Which, again, is the dumbest generation? Who, again, is bankrupting our future and leading to the dark ages? Conclusion. This paper has covered a lot of ground, but as we put these points together, we see an interesting configuration. Allow me, by way of conclusion, to summarize that configuration. First, repeatedly, there are cultural anxieties around new media, but not around all new media. That should make us ask, why this media and not that one? Second, one recurrent form of anxieties about new media is the loss of agency, or rather the transfer of agency from the users to the media itself. Media distracts, it stupefies, it lobotomizes, it makes us dumb. Yet third, and ironically, users have more agency in this current era of internet and other mobile technologies than in most other forms of medias, media. So then we, so then we must ask a final question. If the anxiety is incommensurate with its object, what work is the anxiety itself doing? Perhaps our anxiety about digital youth is a guilty acknowledgement that the future we have left for our youth is not as prosperous as the one we inherited. Perhaps our anxieties about the lonely, alienated, self-absorbed, depressed youth is an expression of our own skepticism about those so-called traditional institutions of school, work, and family, which have certainly not protected us from neoliberalism's erasures of social security and social safety nets. Indeed, there may also be a reversal in considering digital youth within the context of traditional institutions, since a term like traditional institution masks the massive changes that school, work, and family undergo constantly, as well as the infinite variations across and within cultures and subcultures of all of those so-called traditional institutions. The term traditional institution is as much in need of deconstruction into its constituent and contradictory and ever-changing parts as digital youth. Indeed, it may only be from the point of view of a new generation with its own passions and interests and sense of identity that our institutions can even look stable or traditional at all. Like all forms of nostalgic retrospection, the backward glance may actually be as much a never-never land as the fantasy projection of futurity. Perhaps our cultural anxiety should focus on the paradox of digital labor. In this do-it-yourself youth culture, where there is an abundance of agency, there is an also an abundance of creative labor that is being capitalized by the $600 billion behemoth of Google and other sources without public su subsidy for the rising costs of participation, nor remuneration to those users who are generating content. This is exacerbated in our neoliberal global economy that has fewer and fewer outlets of work for young people and increasingly fewer social supports and resources for them. I'd like to end simply by saying that I don't find myself concerned much lately about the lack of agency, producti productivity, and sociality of digital youth. On the contrary, I think young people in whatever it means to say this generation are mobilizing more efficiently than any have in decades. However, I'm increasingly alarmed by what Siva Vaitananathan calls the Googleization of everything, the voraciousness of global capital that exploits the creativity of youth for its own purpose and profit. Thank you.
Sure, I'm happy to. <clears throat> um, thanks, Kathy. I, and I, I have a question that's more like an hypothesis from what you said, which it's, it starts really from where you were um, talking about the notion of a third space with uh, mobile telephones, and which is a term I don't know. And what seemed to me, um, it was sort of explicated as the border between public and private. Right. And <clears throat> what occurs to me in a lot of this is that I, it seems to me that we need to think of and explain it by an actual third space that's neither public nor private. Um, meaning yes. neither subject to private property nor to state control. Right. Um, and that precisely what the anxiety over new, the new technologies that generate anxiety, maybe rationally, because a lot of what you're pointing to is the irrational fears of certain right. things, are those that do refer to this space, like I would call it the space of the common, like a, a space of, of participation and, and uh, network production through creativity, that does, in fact, and maybe the, I'm thinking maybe the anxieties are rational about those technologies that do, in fact, threaten the public and the private. Oh, yeah. In fact, that as much as they are, how do they threaten the public and the private? It's partly because the assertion of the private or the public over them is a, um, is often a, um, how do you say, a destruction of their productivity itself. Like when we assert private property over the kinds of, um, common network participatory produced goods, ideas, et cetera, right. it's, it, it closes down that productivity. Right. And the similarly, even though capital can expropriate it, it has to always do it from a distance. It can't, right. it can't expropriate the way it did in the factory by imposing cooperation, by overseeing discipline, et cetera. It has to, in a way, stand back. Anyway, I, I guess what I'm thinking, two things then, maybe it's more hypothesis in question. One is that and maybe people have because I'm not familiar like you are with all of the discourses within this realm, that we have to think of uh, something that's neither the public nor the private that in fact threatens them both. And that that's what these, mm. these new threatening new technologies point to. And, um, and think of the power of this as, um, as something that's really destructive or potentially destructive of both the public and the private and therefore a rational threat rather than because a lot of what you're talking about is sort of right. irrational hysterias that come up about. Right. Um, I don't know, it seems, okay, it's not a question. No, no, That's I actually, I, I, I like the way you're pushing and it's an, an, an area that hugely interests me. Um, and I'm gonna try to separate it out into some parts. Um, one, I think it is a totally rational fear to worry about what private and public means now. Um, I haven't seen it, but there's some new, apparently terrible movie out um, uh, uh, eagle eye or something that's basically about the way the FBI, FBI can control your cell phone and all that. I'm sorry it's a terrible movie because in fact from what I've been reading on the te on Technorati and, and on various blogs a lot of the technology they expose that is now subject to surveillance that we think of as private like our cell phones um, in fact it's completely accurate that in fact they're using you know FBI people who help design the patriotic the, the implementation of the Patriot System, to Patriot Act and its systems as consultants on the movie. But it's a terrible movie, so I don't think anyone will see it. So anyway, but, but it is, I think it's a real uh, transitional moment where, as in many, many, many moments in history, things that were thought to be public spaces become um, spaces of both governance and governmentality. So the private part of that is having to watch yourself in an almost paranoid way because you don't know who's watching you. Um, you know, so that I think is a very, that's one. That's I think an incredibly real, real fear and a real issue. And I wish there were tons more attention to that right now. And it's, it's shocking to me um, that that hasn't been more um, publicly interrogated, including by what used to be called the right wing, which you would have thought would have been the most um, vigilant people asserting privacy rights and uh, certain kinds of First Amendment rights that have been eroded since the Patriot Act. Um, it's global, though. It's not just the U.S., uh, but it certainly isn't just the PRC either. I mean, a lot of the things we say about uh, surveillance and privatization and, and using technology as a, a mechanism of surveillance in the PRC is being conducted by Google, Cisco, and, and, and Yahoo. Um, and with technologies already in place here in the U.S. that we're just not as aware of. Uh, and that maybe aren't being used um, as repressively 
um, but that certainly have that potential. So that's the one end. Um, what interests me about you know these books like the Bauer Line and the Maggie Jackson book that want to talk about you know the corruption of youth is they act as if that's not happening, as if there's this still this free public space of rational discourse where all the traditional institutions are in place and we all know what provident, private and public are and the divisions are clear. You know, it's some kind of, and that's, I haven't worked it out yet, but it's some kind of almost Freudian projection of what pe adults know to be the case onto um, youth and the behavior of youth that evacuates the scariness of that public-private, um, both ways, that public-private confusion in everyday life. The third thing, and this is, um, you know, reading a lot of survey data and spending the last five years um, talking to, to kids uh, about how they use technologies, is, uh, uh, you know, both interesting in that there's this kind of, I don't even know what the politic, left libertarian, gonzo kind of, yeah, we know that we're being surveyed, but we're going to still do what we want to do, kind of flamboyance and um, uh, uh, rebelliousness that I kind of applaud because it's great. And on the other hand, it scares me in terms of the kind of paper trail or, or a digital trail and the digital dossier that can follow you the rest of your life that, in fact, um, kids, are, kids are creating. So that's, not an, that's also just a lot, of, a lot of things. But I think we're in an utterly transitional moment that we can't, can't see. The reason I like to go back to the 18th century, so many of these issues you know, you can see both what is clear and what isn't, what is paranoia and what is projection and what happens with different kinds of technologies and then what seems to be different um, by those kinds of comparisons. I think the economic and the neoliberalist economic structures of the present um, and, the con and the way that plays itself out um, with this new technology are really, really, really interesting. And, um, you know, I don't, I, th I don't think anyone understands it yet. I think we're in such a transitional moment that we can't really see what all of its configurations are. Yes, Patrick. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I have two questions and then a comment that may reveal why I have these two questions and are complementary to each other. Uh, the first question is, why do we choose mining technology as a point of anxiety? Second question is, uh, well, I'll make the comment first. I would say that, in my experience, mining technology is, uh, as, as artificial intelligence, is far more artifice uh, than intelligence. And the second question ah, is that doesn't our anxiety of the mining technology actually contribute to the capital power of institutions <laughs> that leverage that technology? Um, can I ask you a follow-up question before sure. I answer your question? Um, I didn't understand, although I love it, what you meant by it, data mining is more artifice than, in, than intelligence. Well, I'm just playing on the phrase artificial intelligence um, that I don't think it captures in, any, in, in a very good way uh, human intelligence as much as we may uh, over or underestimate it on a given moment. Yeah, I guess. I don't think it, it, it gets anywhere near the level of complexity. Uh, oh, I, I yeah. yes, yeah, I agree with you. Know, in terms so of like, there are layers of, of artifice. I mean, you know, there's a there's a sort of a huckster uh, element that you know we're trying to say by calling this artificial intelligence, we're actually sort of like overestimating the intelligence of the system. Maybe that's the wrong term. There's an element of that. Then there's also a sort of art form to modeling uh, the intelligence that right, that's sort of is creating its own reality as well. Right. Um, we have to have this, con I, uh, my original field that I got detoured from was artificial intelligence, so it's kind of my hobby now is to keep reading in that field. I think artificial intelligence overestimates artifice and intelligence both for computers and especially for human beings. But that's a whole, that's a whole other perspective on, um, on that. I'm very much on the Jeff Hawkins spectrum on that one. Um, uh, I think the data mining anxiety that I'm most pointing to is less on the level of cognition. That's, my, that's the other project I'm working on. Um, but in this paper, it's more on the, on the more um, practical governmental level of what happens when so much of your private life is recordable and retrievable and searchable 
by people who also um, willfully misuse some of the semantic tubes, tools, some of the so-called Web 3.0 tools to manufacture certain kinds of patterns that may or may not be there simply by the selectivity of the search terms they're using to find, um, to find out what your history is. In other words, if you're taking as data every written record I have produced in the last um, 10 years and then searching that in a very, very selective way, you can, come, you can create a pretty scary profile. Um, even for someone as unscary as me. Right, right. <laughs> but, isn't that, but isn't that like a, a sort of the power of that is the fear of that for somebody to say, I know this about you. You could react, you could react to that gesture by saying, on the one hand, so what? Or on the other hand, you could say, oh my, you know, oh my, you know all this about me. I'm scared. Right. Well, Howard and Rheingold, who I think is one of the, still one of the smartest people um, on um, this whole issue of uh, commun virtual communities, just said, oh, I gave up privacy. Ten I gave up privacy 40 years ago. You know, he was one of the people who was working on the well, that first internet, the ARPANET and first internet projects way back in the 70s, 1973, 75. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he just said, oh, forget privacy. It doesn't, it's a myth. It doesn't exist. And if you believe it, if you believe it exists, you're going to limit yourself. So he said, I just gave that up. Um, you know, maybe, you know, that, that is, that's certainly one point of view about it. It uh, scares the heck out of me. Uh, you know, I just, it's, you know, on November, in, you know, mid-November, I'll be able to tell you how scared I am. But, um, yeah, but it does, right. it scares me a lot. <laughs> Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I, I wonder with reference to your research, how do you keep an eye on the changing forms of aesthetics and arts? How do I keep the, an eye on the aesthetics? Yeah, the changing forms of aesthetics and arts and what effect it has globally or locally. I wow. mean, or, yeah. I, you know, it has such interesting effects. And I don't understand, some of it I don't understand at all. Um, uh, you know, it's a, there's so many interesting, interesting things. We've just hired this person who I think is one of the most brilliant, beautiful artists um, using new media, Bill Seaman, who's here at Duke now. He and I have these conversations, and I'm totally excited about he's, what he's doing. I'm aesthetically totally excited about what he's doing. And then there's a world where I realize my brain just doesn't know how to go there. I mean, you know, you know this idea of talking, brains talking together, what happens if you could communicate in virtual communities and just didn't have the computer there? Uh, which goes back to like, you know, Charles's purse in the 19th century, Augustine before, you know, there are many different people who've talked about communities and mental and visionary communities. I think we're in a very interesting aesthetic world. Um, we're hoping to be able to bring as a visitor to Duke um, a professor at Concordia University, uh, Shawei Bin. I may be confusing him because I have a good friend with a very similar name. And Shashin Wei, thank you. Shawei Bin is my friend. Um, so, um, who's doing these beautiful installations that you go into and you can hear this bird and feel it brush your, te brush your cheek, but you can't see it. It's just you experience the presence of this. I mean, that's pretty, I mean, there's really, really interesting things happening. Uh, a f somebody from India recently sent me this astonishing novel that was written on cell phones and internet and all kinds of things by thousands of people who contributed together. And, and she was writing to ask if I could think about an American publisher. It had been translated into English. I, you know, I realized, I, you know, I was so out of my depth. I mean, this is a bestseller right now in, um, in India. And I, I just, it was like a whole different sphere of, of reference and illusion and narrative association than I understood. Um, I've spent time reading transliterations of Japanese cell phone novels. I don't get them at all. I mean, I'm just so, I just don't, it's not my medium. I don't, I'm not a very good texter, so I don't understand the medium. But I think we're on the verge of some very, very interesting things aesthetically through min both textual, non-textual, visual, sonification, all kinds of really interesting things are happening right now. And um, we've just begun to explore what those implications are and, and, and how that happens. Uh, one of the best, one of the most important ones is authorship. You know, if you're working on things collaboratively with hun sometimes hundreds of thousands of people using new digital media, you know, what does that do to the concept of authorship, which we've, you know, been interrogating for 40 years already? 
uh, it's a very it's very very interesting. Thank you. Yes. I was wondering if you could say something more about this whole question of privacy that you were just talking about. Because it seemed like the old, if there was an old thing, there was a sense of privacy first to do with the body, right. which you feel is private, then the home, which is sort of where you right. live, and so that, there's that secondary, sort of these concentric boundaries of privacy. But then with this new technology, which cuts across all these spaces, right. it seems that what develops, and I'd like you to sort of say a little bit more about this because I'm not sh quite sure where it leads, is new forms of secrecy that, that, that actually is, are also private because there's data encryption, there is um, you know, um, multiple avatars that you can use in all of these virtual oh, yeah. worlds. And so, so instead of privacy, you seem to have sort of a fragmentation, but also a pluralization of multiple forms of secrecy, right. which are all then supposedly linking back to this one individual who's sending their data privately or adopting this avatar in that virtual right. world and so on. But that's, you know, to what extent are those, the way in which the artificial world is also creating some kind of difference between that which can be mined and that which can be encrypted? I, mean, I think, I mean, you know, this, is, this is one of the, one of the areas that I find quite fascinating is how you can create a virtual world with a full, uh, quite rich and varied life that is lived by your avatar, who, you know, it's pretty easy to trace, Patrick, you know much more about this than me, it's pretty easy to trace an avatar back to the, the person who creates it though, right? It depends on what environment you're using, what virtual world. Interesting. Okay. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, on Facebook, I have a whole bunch of friends that are avatars, and I made the mistake once of, of somehow something came out that she actually knew me at Duke, so I because she or he, the avatar, had made the comment that they had met me at Duke when this person had been at Duke. I did what turns out to be like the most ist thing you can do. I don't have a word for what goes before the ist. Of as asking her, I don't have a word for it. Real name, what were you gonna say? I, I asked who are, I said, oh, you know me, who are you? Whoa, I mean, people were unfriending me so quickly. I mean, I just did. I mean, it was such a violation of the community rules. You don't ask an avid, you know, somebody's, Avatar, who they are in, and I'm forgetting the terminologies now, but uh, for, we'll just say, what is it? Meat space, yes. Yes, I was asking a very meatist question. Um, you know, and I mean, literally, I mean, within 20 minutes, uh, half the avatars unfriend, were unfriending me on Facebook. Now, Facebook itself is a virtual, it's a virtual social space. So, so you know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, you know, there, we are in a world where people are creating, I don't know if they're secret identities. They're incredibly public identities. They just don't ha happen to be tied very much to meat life. Or they could be tied to meat life. Um, uh, you know, but they're, they're an alternative identity, which I think is one of those really interesting, that's partly what inspired this paper. In fact, a lot of the um, people who were giving talks in East Asia were Con specifically concerned about virtual identities and how you create privacy and secrecy in, in virtual realms. Um, the other issue, though, about privacy, um, for this book I'm doing on cognition and digitality, I thought I would get a brain scan done because it's really hard to use other people's brain scan, but if you use your own, you own the IP for those. But I got warned, and I'm in a family that happens to have a number of people with brain tumors in it, that if I went to Duke and I had a scan of my own brain and it turned out there was a tumor in it, even if it was showing no effects, that suddenly I would be in this whole system of medicalization that would be acting on my brain as a diseased brain, even though there would be no baseline to suggest that that tumor wasn't all. So my brain is not going in my book. I mean, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be part of that. But that's a very interesting visualization and medicalization example of that idea of the body being privatized, get over that. 
I mean, your body is only privatized in certain very specific situations. And once you, your body happens to go, move over a line into another situation, it's not your body anymore. It would not be my call. It would not be simply my call because insurance is involved, uh, my employer is involved, if it turned out I was having a brain scan simply so I could use my own image in my book and not have to you know, pay to use somebody else's brain image, um, that, that that could suddenly be a situation where my brain was no longer my own brain. So, you know, it's like, these are interesting issues. I mean, we are in very, very, very interesting times. And you know, those two somehow go together. I don't think anyone has quite figured out yet how those go together. And it may well be that the one, the world of virtual worlds and avatars and the alternate self is some kind of a complex response to this world of the, the um, ownership of what used to be, con what we used to at least pretend, if we're, if we're middle class people, uh, pretend was our own, our own body. Oh. Um, context and that you know it, it, an invasion of privacy is when something about you is taken out of context and people make make judgments about you based on they, they only know that one piece of you that's come out and I think this kind of goes back to the original question about um, you know private and public spaces and that we're kind of losing control of contexts of more of our context oh, that's interesting and that's a, a nice way of play, placing it, including virtual environment as a context right so who controls the context that's in which we in which we place our, our identities and I think that also goes goes back to you mentioned Chris Kelty's book and I, li I really like his idea of the recursive public because in a sense he's saying that we are now creating our own context that we can control as a community of, of uh, people who you know, we're creating our own societies in a sense and context and we're trying to manage those societies in ways that are separate from both the kind of public and private sphere, spheres that we've known in the past. Right, right. And I, I think I would, I, I love that point, and I would even push it further to say, and this goes back to your original comment, Michael, that that thing we thought of as private and public spheres is so context driven, not only within the specifics of a historical moment, but a really particularized place with an historical moment. I mean, you know, the most obvious one, the slave and the slave owner, what is private, what is public in those worlds. There's nothing ontologically clear about the definition of private and public. It's entirely related to context and power and legalities or, um, you know, uh, other, other forms uh, of, of definition of can my privacy define your privacy or can my public what is good for the public sphere define you as a private being. And I think that's, it, it's a, a different version of that is happening now. Or, or a new version, a new iteration of that is happening now. I'm not even sure if it's a different version, but it's a, there are different terms in play and different te techne in play in terms of, what, of how we have to think about that. Right. Yes? just thinking with this last point that it, it might be more, it seems to me more useful also with regard to what you were saying that maybe, and with Srinivas, is that maybe rather than thinking about, or maybe in many of the demands for private, it's really a question about freedom or freedom and autonomy and so that even like the desire for privacy in the sense that I don't want someone to know, I don't know what I'm watching on TV at night or something like that is also a matter about freedom or, and I just think that it might be a way out of the, uh, this, uh, I, I feel like one often gets trapped in these things when when demanding uh, privacy, that like so, when you were talking about the the um, the those you admire of a certain anarchist left libertarian saying, I don't care about privacy anymore. They certainly do care about freedom, and it might be just a way that that one has to imagine spaces of freedom and mechanisms of freedom that don't depend on. Uh, the mechanisms that we associate with the private. That's, I don't know if you know Chris County's book. The, uh, two, it's called Two Bits, The Cultural Significance of, of Free Software. And you can uh -huh. download it for, for, for free. Haystack co-published it as a book, so it could, be, um, it could be downloaded free. It's on the Haystack site. You can click to it, and, mm -hmm. and Duke University Press published it. But that's basically his argument, you know, that you, know, you have to think about free. But even freedom has to be, you know, it's certainly not... Uh, it never has been and never will be an unalienated or um, undifferentiated quality, and yet, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, 
he, he plays with the idea of what free software is, and he means free software not, as, not only as not costing money, but not costing in terms of personal individual liberty and social individual liberties and freedom. Mm -hmm. Quite interesting. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Thank so much for much. coming. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.